Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. Uh, if you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit hour for attending today, the login information uh, will be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. Uh, this morning, we're really uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Brian Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh is a, prof is a professor and department chair in radiation oncology at the University of Colorado on Schutz Medical School. He attended Tulane University for undergraduate, graduate, and medical school and completed his residency training at Duke University. His research interests include laboratory studies of how to enhance the effectiveness of radiotherapy by blocking the action of macrophages that stimulate tumor regrowth after treatment. And he also has a special interest in stereotactic radiosurgery for brain tumors and stereotactic body radiation therapy for uh, tumors elsewhere in the body. His recent publication list includes numerous peer-reviewed papers and abstracts directly related to SBRT. And he's co-editor of the first textbook of SBRT. He's also involved in health policy decisions at a national level, serving on a Medicare advisory panel, and also on the board of directors of the American Society of Radiation Oncology, or ASRO. Uh, with that, we're really excited to welcome Dr. Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to visit, even if only virtually. I have no disclosures that I would like to disclose right now, and I hope that's okay. I really don't have any disclosure. Sorry, it's a small joke. I'm just trying to wake myself up as much as anything. I understand we're all still in the throes of living virtually and doing everything so remotely. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. We, of course, here took action just as you have taken action to accommodate visiting professors. We dreamed up this little mechanism called the Virtual Visiting Professor Network and have had a little bit of fun with that. And perhaps some of you have seen some of the presentations. You're always welcome to see any of them live or uh, recorded, they stay up on YouTube now that we've got our own YouTube channel. There was a little commentary about that that Sue Yom asked us to do uh, one time a while back as we were still in, in deep of the pandemic last year. I guess we're still pretty deep, maybe not as deep. I hope getting less and less deep, but well, there you go. The next agenda item for the VVPN version of the Impressive Arc is supposed to be and Arrow's got talent show, and I hope everyone got the Rebus at the top. It was supposed to be clever, but anyway, it's postponed at the moment. We were getting geared up to do it. Amisha Bajaj is one of the Arrow leaders who wanted to do it and um, was driving it, <clears throat> but we sort of came to the conclusion that it's a little too close to Astro and it's a little too early in interview season for some of the senior residents, and so we don't want to add any stress to any, anyone's year and so uh, that particular event is going to be postponed even though you might have seen a little bit of blur about it here now on social media so more to follow we'll be sure to announce the uh the new date and of course would welcome input and, and uh contributions from any resident who might want to throw their hat in the ring or just just show a, a, a two-minute video of yourself doing anything i want you to understand it's not a competition here it's just all meant for fun it'll, it'll just be a matter of, uh, of good fun and a good time we hope it's meant to be a morale booster Okay, so on to today's topic. Um, you see that I took a title that included the word reversal and a few reversals in radiation oncology. So you might as well define what am I talking about when I say a reversal, a medical reversal? Well, I'm stealing that particular phrase from the title of a book that was the place where this term was coined. It was written a few years ago by a certain Dr. Vinay Prasad and his mentor, Adam Sifu. I'm sure many of you who are on social media might have some idea about Dr. Prasad. He is, um, let's say, a polarizing figure at, at times on Twitter and other places where he shows up. He is an oncologist who also now has gone fairly deep into commenting on COVID and various health policy issues related to that. So be that as it may, um, his first book was something which I think was a nice one, and if anyone of you might have read it, you might have found it enjoyable. I certainly did. So uh, where he and his co-author define medical reversal is that, well, let's just say it's something that happened that was pretty big, a pretty big surprise. It was something that maybe challenged preconceived notions or biases and the preferred ways to look at the world and assumptions that were based on maybe bioplausibility, all of which were upended with the results of one or more convincing scientific studies, typically a randomized clinical trial. Uh, some folks in the medical 
public, uh, the particular stakeholders in that related topic might find this to be uncomfortable. They may not be happy with the results. They might have trouble letting go of what was held to be such a common belief in the past. But I might offer the counterpoint that usually the retrospective scope, I think actually offers us a lot of reasons to understand why the results might not have actually been so surprising with of course the benefit of hindsight. So the bigger lesson I think that's from this book and I hope maybe the only lesson that's probably worth taking from this entire talk is that it's important that we always maintain good effort poise when we're trying to study something in medicine and approach it with um, a balanced, uh, as balanced a, a viewpoint as possible and, and always be open to the possibility that sometimes we might see answers to our studies, whether they be in the lab or in the clinic, that are not what we expected. I'll just give you an example, or just from my own memory. When I was just out of training, uh, I was, I'm not a cardiologist, but as a fan of medicine or just an interest, interested spectator of medicine in general, I suppose, I would say that the example that stood out for me around the time when I was actually finishing up my internship, beginning my residency, was something called the CAST study, the Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Study. This is something published in the New England Journal, and it goes something like this. It had to do with the idea that cardiologists felt it was so blatantly self-evident that a person who's in the ICU or the CCU cardiac care unit after an MI showing signs of an arrhythmia, well, that can't possibly be good, right? And so it was a question of what could we do? And then, of course, uh, uh, how, it, it was assumed by so many that giving medications that would suppress those little odd blips on the EEG, EKG strips would be, of course, a good thing. Just makes sense. Why stress the heart? Well, it turns out that maybe is not such a good idea because this particular trial, I think, surprised a lot of people because medication is used to suppress that particular observation, which intuitive, intuitively seemed to be so important to suppress, in fact, didn't do the patient any favors. There was actually a decrement in survivorship for patients who received agents which suppressed this reaction in the heart after an MI. And the bottom line was that cardiac and all-cause mortality was actually worse with the use of these drugs. I and mean, it sent shockwaves to the cardiology community. I mean, I personally didn't have a huge uh, uh, dog in this race or anything like that, but I, I think I, I saw that from a distance and was just impressed that that was uh, such a big surprise to some folks. And to me, it, it was something that, that stuck around in my head. And I, I, there have been many an example uh, ever since. There are other examples that you can find in the text I mentioned. And, um, and there you go. So I thought just because I had never fashioned a talk in this sort of context that it might be fun to do it and look at a few, what I might consider to be important or noticeable reversals in radiation ecology over the past some number of years. I also understand that if it's, it's also impossible to bring new information to anyone, whether you're doing it in a virtual format or whether I'd be there in person. The speed of information transfer nowadays is much too quick. I can't possibly tell you anything that you haven't already seen somewhere published. So I'm obliged simply to look back at some other information that's already out there and maybe reframe it or repurpose it or reinterpret it for you. So that's uh, also the motivation here. So what are the reversals that we might want to consider today in this talk? Well, of course, it's going to be about RTOG0617, right? I mean, this is why I picked this topic, of course. Um, once I understood I'd be coming to Emory, and I uh, am a big fan and friend of Dr. Jeff Bradley, I was certainly inspired to try to fashion something that would be, have a little bit of global resonance, right? And so that's actually the key motivating, uh, I would say, sentinel study, a sentinel event that triggered this whole theme of the talk. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about another study that came out that was, I think, a shakeup to a lot of people. This is Flatten versus Cetuximab study for head and neck cancer. I think there's a lesson about maybe a straw man and a lesson about a few other things perhaps that might be going on in the background of that. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the erythropoietin story, the EPO story, because I actually think that that is maybe an underappreciated gigantic story that is not that long ago, but has already dimmed in our memory. I, I think maybe some of us remember a few other big pharmaceutical things that have happened, but I don't know if there was one actually as big as that one that's happened, certainly not in my lifetime that I can remember or my professional lifetime. So we'll, we'll touch on that. And as we go through these particular 
items, we'll try to consider a few things. We'll say, we'll, we'll go out there and say, well, what was the surprise? What was it that was so unexpected about the results of whatever study? Why were some people very disappointed? Should we have seen it coming? And then of course, well, you know, I have to occupy some time. So there might be a few tangential stories here and there for context and maybe some infotainment, if you will. As I say that, I'm also going to give you a bit of a visual, which will be, of course, probably offensive to many people this early in the morning, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm going to say, you know, as we go through some of these discussions and try to put them in context, we might be doing a little time traveling. So the wormholes that we're going to be going through in and out of in terms of recent history in clinical radiobiology, let's just call it, includes several over the past, I'd say, number of decades. The decades that I've been, I would say, conscious as a as a radiation oncologist or entering radiation oncology, uh, we know that uh, the chemo radiation, the chemo RT era is still with us. It's been around for quite some time. Don't hold me to the exact years of starting and stopping to these eras. And of course you can dispute and question me on whether you believe I'm representing history accurately. But I would say that some number of years ago, there was a peak phase of the era of hyperfractionation, a lot of which was inspired by Jack Fowler and his work fashioning the linear quadratic model. We're now, I think, in an era that's replaced that to a large extent with immunomodulation of all sorts. We know the Pacific study and all the other efforts to incorporate immunotherapy in cancer treatment in all sorts of directions. There was, I think, a phase that might have ended, I think, a couple of years ago that would have been a popularity of trying to figure out targeted therapy as a radiosensitizer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. There was also a phase, I think that large somewhat predates that, where there was the accelerated repopulation fascination. That was something that erupted after uh, Withers' paper in 1988, suggesting some decrement in outcome with prolongation of treatment time, overall treatment time. There's a lot of pros and cons of that particular study, but it held a lot of sway for quite some time. We know, of course, that we're also currently in the era of, era of hypofractionation SBRT, right? And that's probably 20-ish years old, I would say. And I don't have to explain that to anybody because everything we read now has something to do with hyperfractionation, SBRT, uh, oligomerous type disease, et cetera. And along the bottom there, maybe not so easy to read, is this, I'd say, undulating rhythm, this little background low hum that has something to do with tumor hypoxia because it's been an item on everyone's radar for quite some time, but it kind of comes and goes off of people's radar and enthusiasm for it waxes and wanes depending on what's the current thinking or maybe what's the most fashionable thing anyone's doing in that space nowadays, but it's always sort of humming in the background. So I think that's a little bit of um, something that will have context for maybe some of our stories later on. So that's the that's the time traveling we might dip in and out of, and, and I hope it uh, doesn't uh, give anybody motion sickness too badly. All right, so we return to the beginning of the discussion of RTOG 0617, and we see the handsome Dr. Jeff Bradley smiling at us right there. It is a study that's been reported and updated. It was first out in 2015, actually, Lancet Oncology updated again in the JCO a couple years ago, and so, the question is, first of all, well, what was the surprise? All right, um, I want you to notice that as I'm putting up this slide, Dr. Bradley's face has changed a little bit. I'm gonna go back for a second there. Um, his facial expression is smiling right here. He's a little more concerned right now. Now, he would have been concerned if we were live. I might've actually asked a quiz question to one of the residents in the audience. And I would have said, well, what's the big surprise about that? And I, I wouldn't do that because if you would not have known that particular answer for some reason had not yet gotten to that study, I, I, I'm, I think he might have, you know, he might have been a lot comfortable there, might have put your but actually, the more I thought about it, I don't know if he's actually starting to frown at some of the audience, more like, he's probably a little bit worried now about what I'm actually going to say, and, and I get that, and I, I think it's probably, in fact, he's probably so concerned at this point, he, he's probably only moments away from going full on Michaela on this, because he doesn't really have any idea what he says, it's, it was a terrific study, and I, he's, he's kind of afraid that I'm gonna ruin everything about it. I, I'll try not to, Jeff, I promise you, I'll try to uh, represent this respectfully as much as I can and uh, tell it like it is and just give a couple of other takes on it, which you might, might have heard before and uh, we'll just go from there. So the big surprise is not really a surprise to anyone on this call, right? Because lo and behold, unexpectedly, in a comparison of 60 gray against 74 gray radiation, the overall survival 
and progression-free survival were worse with the higher dose. That's it. That's what happened. That was the surprise. Whatever it was, that's the surprise. I think that was something of a reversal. I think that the majority of folks expected the dose escalation to be a benefit for all the reasons that you might have expected that to be a benefit. And I think it was something of a reversal for folks to have to face. I would put that in that category of reversals to say that, yeah, well, okay, I didn't see that coming, but uh, here we are. Now, if I were gonna say, well, why were some people disappointed? I, I mean, well, I, it's probably a no brainer. Um, okay, I have a picture coming up and I, I know this is probably a little bit sensitive to show to an audience who are mostly Atlanta based and I apologize for that, but. I struggled with this, but I'm doing it anyway. If I had to explain why were you know, some people disappointed, um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, for radiation oncology, this was a Super Bowl. It's like we're trying to try to prove that more is better. I mean, a lot of some is good and more is always better. We've done better and better. And it was like getting the rug pulled out from us. I, I'm gonna change this picture. I gotta move away from this picture pretty quickly because I, I suspect it might be causing heartburn for some people, but um, I apologize, I just had to use it. But this was, this was Super Bowl light uh, for, for radiation oncology, right? I mean, it's, it's an escalation. We're using all the technology, IMRT, et cetera, et cetera. We're really good, we're smarter. Uh, we're doing so much better. And it didn't, it didn't work out right. So I, that's really, really a disappointing thing, I think for the field in a way, because it makes us really question our, uh, the poor fiber of our being, right? So, so here we are, faced with this uncomfortable choice or an uncomfortable result. I just have to deal with some of this. So, all right, should we have seen this coming? I mean, was there any reasonable uh, reason to, to really expect it or are there reasons looking back on it where at least we shouldn't have been so shocked? And so I, I'm gonna put up a few and just add a few comments about this as we just look back at this particular reversal or what I would consider a reversal. So exhibit A I will offer you is the experience that happened also about 20 years ago, of high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell, stem cell transplant for breast cancer. This was all the rage early in my training, early in my career, I should say. It was actually during my training, there was all this stuff going on, the phase three studies were going on while I was a resident too. And it was similarly an expectation, an almost full-blown conclusion that, well, some chemotherapy is good, more should be better, right? Well, it turned out not to be the case. There is such a thing as too much chemotherapy, just as there is too much of almost anything. And so um, this is one of the half a dozen or so studies that compared high-dose chemotherapy, stem cell rescue, with regular chemotherapy and did not move the needle on overall survival. And a big disappointment to the folks who were involved in those, just as I think it's a disappointment to the folks, uh, in a lot to a lot of the folks involved in the uh, 0617 study. And uh, the expectation was a different result, but it is what it is. That's what we, um, that's the world we live in. So, I'll offer as exhibit B, a previous study in the RTOG. So it published some number of years ago, the RTOG A311 study, which was a comparison of a number of dose levels. Now this was in the Fowler era of hyperfractionation, just to put it in historical context. And so what we're talking about here are schedules of treatment that were all done at 1.2 gray BID twice a day. But still there was actually the similar signal that I think we saw in the 0617 study, which is to say there was improvement with escalation up to a point, and then there was a point of diminishing returns. For whatever reason, it just was. That's just the way it played out. And so up to that level of 1.2 gray BID to about 69.6 gray, there might have been some additional improvement, but beyond that, not so much. If you were to convert that to an equivalent, uh, that's 69.6 gray, that was a little bit better than others, is around 64 gray. And once you get up to the 74 and 79 grade doses, well, you're in that territory of the higher dose range equivalent of what was 0617. And I think that's, um, in retrospect, it was something that would have, I think, informed or at least led uh, the results of the study not to be such a big surprise. Let me just talk about two more points specifically with 0617, because I can't resist talking about them uh, for reasons I'll just explain. There, was, there is a low level conversation, I should say, that picks up on a tiny, tiny issue, in my opinion, tiny issue related to the PTVs that were used in that study. And then, of course, hey, we're in the immune era, right? So we have to bring the immune system into it, of course. So um, let me just touch on that first point. So uh, reading from the text of the initial report, or the most recent, I think, update, um, it was pointed out that for the high-dose arm, 
there was a 0 0.6 millimeter difference in the size of the PTD margin on average. And I have heard at least one or two folks point that out as something that might be some cataclysmic difference and a huge explanation. This is perhaps a, a statement I can take questions about later. I disagree with that particular interpretation. And so just for kicks, I went ahead and took a random patient, an actual patient I'm treating right now, an actual patient with stage three non-small cell lung cancer. I'm treating this individual to a dose of 60 gray, getting some chemo. And I just went through the very simplistic exercise. I was gonna do it for a bunch of patients, but I said, I'll just do it for one. Yeah, I don't know, you can challenge me, you can do it for 10 patients of your own and see if you're gonna come up with a different result. But all I did was a simple exercise of saying, okay, fine. There was a PTB, I called something a PTB. What if I had made that a millimeter bigger? Or I should say, what if I was supposed to have treated something a millimeter bigger? Would that have made some huge dosimetric difference? And so the DBH you can see difference is right here, okay? So what you see is in the pink or lavender, I guess, is the original PTB dose distribution, right? So 97% of it is getting 60 gray. The mean dose is 63.06 gray. Um, if the PTB I was supposed to have treated was one millimeter bigger, okay, 95% of it's getting 60 gray. The mean dose is 62.7 gray. I, I cannot be convinced that that in itself is any kind of meaningful difference. In other words, I'm dispensing with that particular comment about that study. If Dr. Bradley's in the audience and has a different opinion, I'd be, much, I'd, I'd be quite curious to, uh, to hear it or if anyone else there has a different opinion. Okay, ah, let's take a quick trip down memory lane and I promise you there is a relevance here. So this is the last day of the San Diego Astro meeting, 2017. The handsome young fellow you see in the picture is none other than Dr. William Stokes, an esteemed member of your faculty and one of our proud graduates, or the, one, of our, one of the graduates of whom we are so proud. He was giving a talk about not small cell lung cancer, by the way, uh, a talk that was eventually published um, as a paper. And um, he was first author of this particular paper. He was discussing post-treatment mortality after surgery in SBRT for um, early stage lung cancer. And um, oh, by the way, I should say, this particular paper, I do believe is Brandon Stokes's absolutely most hated paper of all. You might follow him on social media. He's a thoracic surgeon in New York. Um, he spurs back and forth with Morgan Hockey about a lot of different things. Um, seems a reasonable person, but at one point I do remember him commenting. He said this is uh, his least favorite paper because I think he doesn't like the result, but that's another story. So what's the point here? So um, I'm going there because I'm going to watch the good Dr. Stokes give this presentation because it's the last day of Astro. He's doing a great job and he's, he's uh, one of our favorite uh, residents. And, and lo and behold, that same day, there happens to be in that same room in a session just before that, what I thought was a pretty interesting secondary analysis. There was a secondary analysis of 0617 that looked at whether the dose of radiation to the immune system had anything to do with outcome. And in fact, it was a strong suggestion that it was. I have not yet found this particular paper to have been fleshed out into any sort of manuscript, but that's okay. I just happened to notice it. And then we, at back at the ranch, uh, started talking about that. So um, once again, just to point out, we are in the era of chemo RT. And so we're in the era of immunomodulation. So there just has to be uh, all these, it, it's just so obvious that you're going to try to look for connection between the two things, right? And so because I happened to be there, and then we started chit-chatting about it back at home and started to see, well, I don't know, we should just take a look at this and do what they did. So we, we went ahead and did that just to see if we saw anything. So we took the same model of dose to the immune system that was used in the gen secondary analysis that I showed you just a second ago on R2G, g which is a model that includes parameters such as the mean lung dose, the mean heart dose, and the composite whole body dose. There's a couple of fractionation, uh, uh, factors in there, a little bit of hand waving, throw in some eye of newton. You come up with this score that is the effective dose of radiation to the immune compartment, right? So we did that. We had a very ambitious and, and energetic young medical student who was spending time with 
some time with us at the time called library. He's, he's a resident now, not at our place. He blew us off, but that's okay. Um, I hope, I, I still wish him well, but you know, he didn't come and stay with us, but that's okay. Um, and um, no, he's doing great. He's, he's a good guy, very nice guy. I can't remember where he is. I think he's at, uh, then he'll come back to me. It doesn't matter. Um, so he was first author in this. And lo and behold, we saw this observation that, yeah, just guess what? Um, if you were to compare folks who had a lower dose of radiation to their immune compartment using this particular model, you would see that they had a better outcome than the folks who had a higher dose. I'm not showing it here, but there was also a correlate with lymphocyte counts. Uh, there was a couple of other warts to our data. It wasn't the, I would say, most perfectly smooth collection of data, but it's real life. Uh, it still, I think, told the story. And, uh, you know, we thought it was interesting. And if you don't believe us, it's okay. There were a number of other people who followed us, including the Christie Hospital group, uh, Corrine Trevor Finn and some others who had an experience, of course, because it's a big center, nine times bigger than our experience, 900 patients. Of course, they included both small cell and non-small cell uh, patients in there. I saw effectively the same thing, that uh, folks who had lymphopenia would do not so well uh, with chemo radiation for lung cancer, small and not small cell lung cancer. They even went a step further and tried to refine the model a little bit. I won't go into extreme detail, but it's all there for the taking if that's of interest to anyone. Uh, it's in JTO. Uh, they, they found that the heart dose, the lung dose, and also some thoracic vertebral body dose was important. Presumably, there might be still some amount of either active marrow or some indirect way that there's a lot of, I don't know, lymphopoiesis or lymphocyte stem cells going through there, who's to say. But in any case, um, I thought validation. So the point of all this is just that we had this observation disappointing to a lot of people, perhaps not so shocking in retrospect, because we always tend to get to a plateau of intensity and benefit, and there's always diminishing returns. And maybe there are some even more interesting explanations that we can begin to explore and, and come around to. And, and, you know, we didn't exactly invent looking at lymphopenia as a metric that might be important for the outcome of patients getting radiation therapy. That's been around for years, head and neck cancer, some brain cancer, brain tumor studies like that. But, you know, again, it just goes along, I think, with, uh, with that study. And it just, just uh, encourages us all to be a little bit open-minded to what could still happen. Okay, moving along. Let's look at what I think, I think felt like a reversal to a lot of people. And that was when cetuximab went head to head with cisplatin as a radius sensitizer. This is, of course, uh, the study of interest that I'm talking about. It was presented at a clinical trials or plenary session a couple of years ago at an ASTRO meeting. It's the uh, RTOG 1016 study. HPV positive cancer, head and neck, uh, cisplatin versus uh, the sexy cetuximab as radio sensitizer, what was the surprise? The surprise for some people, disappointment to some people, I think, was, I hate to say it, this platinum beats tuximab. It's just any, any way you slice it, any way you look at it, overall survival, better local regional control. It's just the way it is. And um, not, I think it wasn't the favorite result for a lot of people, um, but but again, it's just that that's the way it came out with it. If, if, if we were to psychoanalyze, what was it that was the disappointment about this? I mean, I, I'll just offer a couple of suggestions about why I think a lot of people found that disappointing or disheartening or whatever. I think it has something to do with this. Um, so what I'm looking at here, um, sometimes I'll just play around with this. The Ngram viewer for Google is something where you can look at the usage of a word or a phrase over time and see when it came into existence in the published literature in English or any other language for that matter. Um, and then on the right side, I'll sometimes just look and see what phrases are popular or at least become part of citations in Google Scholar over time. And so if you look at this phrase, targeted therapy, targeted therapy, it's a nice buzzword, right? It really didn't exist until maybe the turn of the century. And then it became somewhat popular. I'm not sure to say that it's leveled off, but the Ngram viewer might say that it, maybe it's past its peak, jump the shark, who's to say, I'm not sure. And the Ngram viewer is, uh, is a compilation of books. Google Scholar, of course, has published uh, literature, medical literature. But you can see similarly that the targeted therapy for cancer phrase, and I, I could have picked a lot of different words, I happen to settle on that one, came into being around the turn of the century, uh, 2000 or so, and has become more popular or more frequently seen in published literature. 
and I think it was just that, you know, this idea of a targeted therapy, the idea that you're thinking of something that's new and clever, never been thought of before, magic bullet, you're a superhero, right? I mean, you're like this Hawkeye guy, right? You can, you're, you're gonna send the flaming arrow or just a regular sharp arrow with pinpoint accuracy, hit something that you're trying to hit, not do an ounce of damage to uh, a random flying pigeon that goes past you. But in fact, no, you're gonna hit the villain right in the heart, right in the chest and get him and that's great. Um, it's a nice fantasy. It's, I think, an aspirational goal. Uh, and I think it was something that a lot of people were really hoping for. It just didn't play out that way. It uh, didn't turn out to be as clean a result, I think, as a lot of people were hoping for. Well, should we have seen it coming? And while we're at it, should we have known this result a decade sooner? I just have to put that particular question out there. In fact, we'll take the second question first. Should we have known this result a decade sooner? Well, okay, the study that was the, one of the bases for one of the arms of the R2G 10-16 study was the one that was published in 2006, Jim Bonner and colleagues, that was a study of radiotherapy and cetuximab against radiotherapy alone. The accrual was between 1999 and 2002. Notice that it's radiotherapy plus cetuximab versus radiotherapy alone. So the question is, yeah, I mean, is that a straw man? Uh, you know, should they have done something a little bit more challenging as a comparator arm or a control arm? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'll just say that if you look at the early radiation plus or minus chemotherapy trials that showed a benefit to the combined treatment, there are at least seven or more, and I'm probably forgetting some, that had already been approved by then, presented at national meetings, and some of them published by then, which had all shown a benefit to the combination of chemotherapy and radiation now. Well, okay. Hindsight's 2020, right? Should there, uh, you know, should the original cetuximab study have been done against radiation chemotherapy? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I, I just put that out there because, um, you know, the first one I remember was David Brazell's study, 1998. It was published. I just remember because it was accruing while I was still a resident of Duke, so I just remember that particular one actually going on in real time as I was in training, and of course, all the other ones I think most of you are familiar with. Um, again, most of them published a little bit after maybe the accrual finished for the Bonner study. Having said that, they were published that time. They were usually presented before then. So I might just say that it's something that we should have maybe, I don't know, thought about. Now, the other reason is like, well, should we have seen it coming? Okay, if you, if you actually just look at the um, actual preclinical studies that were cited in the Bonner paper, the 2006 study, uh, there's a quote there that says, radiation increases the expression of EGFR in cancer cells and blockade of EGFR signaling sensitizes them to the effects of radiation, blah, blah, blah. And then cetuximab, blah, 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 uh, enhances the cytotoxic effects of radiation in sperm cell carcinoma. So let's just look at the seven references that were actually cited as being justification for doing this particular study. Uh, the first one was a, an entirely artificial construct where you had EGFR being inserted into an ovarian, ovarian cancer cell line and doing something in vitro. I, I, Enough said, that's just, that, that's not that close to reality, clinical reality of a head and neck cancer human patient. Uh, the second one actually was a negative study. It didn't actually show anything. It, 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 there was some EGFR that was being sprayed upon cells that didn't actually do anything, radio sensitivity wise, so it was interesting. The third one, uh, A431 cells. If you know anything about A431 cells, their entire cell membrane is EGFR receptor junk. It's just crammed full, it's abnormally, uh, replete with those things. So abnormal that it is, it's, it's just a weird cell to work with. So I have to say that's, that's weird. Yeah, the next one was an in vitro thing. I don't know about in vitro, the, 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 the ones to follow used odd fractionation levels. Another one used both A431 cells and an 18 gray single dose. I'm not sure how, and I could go on. But in any case, the point is, when you look back on it, uh, well, I don't know how tight and how secure uh, the radio sensitization data was. Again, we have the retrospective scope going on here. I know it's unfair to say that, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm just, with the retrospective scope, you can, you can see different things, right? Okay. Now, one other thing about this. So um, I mentioned that we are sort of talking about something which might, in fact, be the death knell, the tail end, the band of of the era of targeted therapy as radio sensitizer, right? The, the results of that study and a couple of similar ones like it. It overlaps, in fact, with the withers and accelerated depopulation um, era. And so just because I had already put that up there, I have to make some kind of connection to it. Now, I just want to um, 
point out, you know, that you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I was a tiny part of a certain amount of EGFR related research because everybody was doing something that had to do with EGFR, right? So where I was, North College of Virginia, uh, the chair there was a, a German guy named Herbert Schmelrick. He had a, an entirely different take on it. He was playing around with radiation and EGFR interactions from a vantage point of looking to see if that was the key or that was a potential Achilles heel for reversing that other thing people had been concerned about, accelerated repopulation. And so in this particular study, uh, what you're seeing there is um, on the bottom panel in the gel, you're seeing some uh, phosphorylation of EGFR by radiation or by agent. You're seeing that phosphorylation blocked by a tyr tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And you're seeing on the right-hand panel, it's the double negative. You're seeing a reversal of the accelerated population you can see if you set your conditions right. And believe me, you have to have a full moon. It's gotta be a Thursday. You gotta have um, Mars and Jupiter aligned and a lot of other special conditions. But if you set some artificial positions up, which I'll talk, tell you about what they are if you really want to hear them, you can see an observation of what appears to be an apparent uptick in rate of acceleration or rate of growth of cancer cells. And you can block that with an EGFR TTI, fine, not said. That particular uh, uh, line of work didn't really go much further than that. Um, it was the beginning of the end, frankly, of my ill-fated, failed career. Uh, early as it was, it was killed off, mercifully killed off in its infancy. I, I, I'm not cut out to be a physician scientist. I'm a dilettante at best when it comes to that. Um, but uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I had that. If I were to be asked, was the whole accelerated repopulation thing really a thing? I don't think so, but that's another lecture topic, right? We're talking about some reversals and what lessons we can learn from that. So back to what I said, I thought was, in a way, the biggest reversal of them all in oncology, at least in my memory. And it had to do with EPO, erythropoietin. So here we are, back to our little time travel in the wormhole. I mentioned that all along, for decades, there has been the rattle and hum of something to do with modulating tumor hypoxia, talking about it, trying to mess with it, trying to exploit it, trying to do something with it, right? Decades and decades of that. But that was something of the background context of this particular study, which I'll mention as, I think, a legit reversal. As a matter of fact, there are some others like it, as you'll see, but let's use this particular RTOG study, because we're all fans of the RTOG, right? Now called NRG. Uh, study as an example of what I think was another reversal. And this study, uh, in principle, was a head and neck cancer study, fairly straightforward randomization, radiation with or without erythropoietin as an agent that might be potentially radiosensitizing by means of improving tumor oxidation indirectly from correcting anemia. What was the surprise? The surprise was, yeah, it didn't do that. And as a matter of fact, it sort of made it a little bit worse. Uh, lo and behold, once again, we see not only a flat result, but something going in the wrong direction or the unexpected wrong direction. So on the left, you have local regional progression. On the right, you have uh, overall survival, both, both of which, uh, if you can see the legend there, are uh, you know, to, to the bad with, with EPO. Um, didn't hit st statistical significance, but actually that curve looks, you know, I think pretty convincing. So um, so there you have it, a disappointing result. Now, why were some people disappointed? I think there were two groups of people who were disappointed. There were academics because there were a whole lot of people who were interested in tumor hypoxia and erythropoietin and whether the two could be uh, combined or whether the one could be used to combat the other. Once again, using my cheesy little scoring system of Google Scholar and searching at this time for, for the combination of tumor hypoxia and erythropoietin, there was nothing, it was not talked about until 1990 or so, there were a couple of papers in that decade. And then there were something like 1500 or so papers suddenly because a lot of people got very, very interested in it in the early 2000s. Well, did pharma have an interest in this? I, I think so. Um, if you look at the 1990 revenues for the combination, was at that point it was only erythropoietin that Amgen was selling and they later added another similar agent called Barbro. Poetin, um, their revenues had come from zero up to 200 million or so in 1990 and had eclipsed the 5 billion mark by 2005. So yeah, pharma had some, 
some interest in seeing erythropoietin do well. Now, a lot of that expense, it's true, was for patients in end-stage real disease. Still, a ton of it was actually for cancer patients. All right, so should we have seen this coming? Was this a surprise? Should it have been, um, um, should it have been such a big disappointment or should it have been something like, yeah, well, okay, we could have seen it coming or should we have been maintaining good equity for a long time? Okay, well, all right. To get to that question, here we go. I will take you on a strange trip. We'll call it a highly eclectic, if not downright eccentric, very selective, history of hypoxia and some efforts to overcome suspected radio resistance in hypoxic tumors. At best, you will say, this is a woefully incomplete historical rendering of that story. There would be much too much to say. However, I think there are a few tidbits that we're gonna pick and choose from. that will just be highlights, that will add context to get back to the point I was trying to make in the first place. Here we go. The very first, preclinical experimentation that was done that showed a connection between hypoxia and radio resistance was in the 1930s. It was done by a guy named Crabtree, a colleague named Kramer. Crabtree was a physiologist. He was big into cellular metabolism. He had some theories about how the so-called respiratory system inside cells, the part that processes oxygen, had something to do with radiation sensitivity. He didn't really know what. And it was kind of a fishing expedition that he did to sort of set up some experiments that would put some cells in vitro under conditions of either aerobic exposure or anaerobic exposure. Uh, let them sit near some radium for a while, put them into some animals and see how big they got. So uh, I just find it charming in a way that what you're seeing here, the results such as they are that are being reported here. I mean, if you looked at that today, you would think that's some kind of, I don't know, weird Western blot or something like that. But what he's showing you there are actual sketches of tumor sizes that were observed after re-implanting the irradiated cells. And so uh, the upshot of the uh, results are that in the first column, there's aerobic, there's oxygen and radiation for 30 minutes. The second column, the cells were radiated under anaerobic conditions, so no oxygen, hypoxic, and the tumors that grew were bigger than the ones in the first column. Same thing for the third and fourth column, and uh, some controls all the way on the end. So that was actually the very first time anyone had even actually directly connected those two dots. For reasons we didn't expect or for reasons that we might interpret differently, but that's, uh, that's where that came from. No story of any science in cancer is complete without a fruit fly somewhere in the picture. I'll just say that there was another series of experiments that looked at how much oxygen needed to be present to cause that radio sensitization effect. And the assay here that is used is actually the change in expression of a certain gene in fruit flies that would change the appearance of their eyeballs. And I shudder to think the hapless graduate student who had to examine the eyeballs of a ton of fruit flies, I, I don't imagine it's particularly pleasant work, but in any case, to show that what you did find in fact is a higher level of the radiation induced expression of this gene under aerobic conditions than anaerobic conditions, fine. There's your fruit fly for you. Oh, there he is buzzing. Oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot there was animation on this particular study. Let's see, that's, I had some fruit flies in my house the other day. We had our um, compost stay around for a little too long. Here it goes. My son actually was trying to make some kombucha. Fruit flies did him in, he gave up. It's kind of a fashionable thing to do for a certain generation nowadays. All right, no story of hypoxia and its history is complete without at least a tip of the hat to Tomlinson Gray. Everyone should know, uh, I should say, trainees in radiation oncology, going through the radio biology textbook, will come across an observation that in spheroids, there is a limit to how much oxygen diffuses through tissue. It's about 180 microns, I recall. And so in some spheroids models, the Thomas and Gray uh, team reported in the 50s, an observation of necrosis as a result of hypoxia in the spheroid model. That was another step in the way of uh, uh, continuing to give us laboratory models and understanding of that. Uh, there was a jazzy set of um, experiments done not long after that in Britain also, I think, in the 70s that actually looked at the timing of when the oxygen has to be there. This is a fast mixing study that was done um, by this team. And um, 
the, the fundamental observation is that if the oxygen is already there, you're good. If it is delayed even a few milliseconds, it's too late. Those moieties that you're trying to stabilize with your oxygen are too unstable. They go away and your rate of sensitization with oxygen doesn't happen uh, if it's not there at the right time. Hyperbaric oxygen, just to be fair, to look at this, uh, there was, there was uh, you know, off and on different levels of enthusiasm for using hyperbaric oxygen as a way to force that into the tissue. There's some different memories of that whole experience. It was a largely negative experience. Uh, there are only two borderline positive studies of the dozen or so that were done. So just to be complete, hyperbaric oxygen never actually did solve the problem, nor in fact did transfusions. Now I say this in particular because there was <clears throat> uh, a well-known study from Princess Margaret done I think in the eighties, uh, led by Team Files and some others led that team. And it was initially reported in a way that might've made it look as if giving transfusions was a way to radiosensitize certain patients with cervix cancer. In fact, the reanalysis really didn't ever show that. And as a matter of fact, it didn't show it probably because there really isn't such a tight connection between hemoglobin levels and the oxygenation levels in tumors. This is from some other Eppendorf probe work that the same team has done. And you can see this, that there's no rhyme or reason to a plot of hemoglobin levels against percent of oxygenation. So be that as it may, um, there were spotty signals, again, all along the way, something about hypoxia, we need to do something about it. It's really hard to get at. There were a half a dozen or more other efforts to try to overcome the problem in different ways, all of which failed. I won't talk about all of them. But in particular, we'll just come back to saying, yeah, it, it, it didn't really even work with giving transfusion. So um, be that as it, way, as it may, uh, it, if I also were to answer the question, well, you know, should we have seen it coming? Yeah, I mean, just to be fair, that particular RTOG study, I don't want to feature it because that's our, that's our home team, right? Um, it was not actually the first study to be published in that exact space. There was another group, German group, that published a few years before, fundamentally similar study, radiation plus minus EPO, had neck cancer, likewise, uh, worse progression to survival. Uh, in most subgroups, there was a post-op subgroup that is about a tie, but a worse outcome with EPO uh, in, uh, in most of those uh, subgroups. But, but I said that I tried to characterize this as a bigger issue even than our parochial little concerns about radio sensitization, because it was. Because as a matter of fact, it wasn't just radio oncology who was looking at EPO to do something good to augment whatever treatment was being given to tumors. I mean, it was all of oncology, all of medical oncology. And <clears throat> there was a, a, um, <clears throat> a preponderance a phase two studies, which, which were once again, assumed to be always beneficial because of, of course, how, how clean and cool is it to be able to uh, correct or make a patient supposedly feel better by giving them a boost in their hemoglobin and uh, do it with a nice little clever mechanism. It's not like this messy, you know, stick a bag of blood up against the, uh, on the pole and direct, direct it into them. It's a little magic with um, <clears throat> a little, little fancy molecule doing that. But, in fact, it began to become more and more obvious to a lot of people who were working in this area that, yeah, <clears throat> there's a lot of downsides to this particular type of <clears throat> agent. There's a lot of blood clots that happen. Um, and quite frankly, <clears throat> there simply isn't um, the amount of home runs being hit that you might expect. So I, I think this particular meta-analysis that was put together um, in the late 2000s was probably the nail in the coffin of EPO as an adjunct specifically in an effort to try to make a cancer therapy better. It was a compilation of about 53 randomized studies, one of which was in fact the radiation study, two of which were the radiation studies I mentioned. So it included radiation plus minus EPO studies, also chemotherapy plus minus EPO studies. And the bottom line is, is worse. I mean, you had a worse survival with erythropoiesis stimulating agents, right? ESA or EPO, EPO are its cousins. Um, so in other words, for really a long time, a lot of patients were getting a rather loosely justified medication and actually experiencing a worse outcome. And it was kind of subtle and so the background was going on all that time. And I, I think it was a bit of a shock. It was, it, it was actually a, a, a fairly strong upheaval for reasons I'll develop in just a minute. Now, I, I already told you I'm a failed physician scientist and I failed in so many things. I couldn't. I can't cover all my failures. 
I'll just point out um, one puny little paper that I did write when I was in Virginia. In retrospect, I'm kind of glad I did write it. Um, well, I had some help, of course. It was a team of us. And we simply looked at the cost of giving EPO or blood transfusions for service cancer patients receiving chemo RT. Um, we looked at a cohort of actual patients who got blood transfusions, compared that to the anticipated expense of what it would have been if we had given them <clears throat> EPO instead to correct it. It wasn't too hard to do this particular thing. It's more, it was more expensive to give drug than to give transfusions. Um, you could play around with the factors, the input factors, and change the price of the drug, and eventually you get to where it's tied. Or you could quadruple the price of an infusion, and eventually you get to a tie. But um, bottom line, <clears throat> as it was structured, and, and as the way it played out, <clears throat> it was uh, uh, you know more expensive to give EPO than to give simple transfusion. If your fact, your goal is to correct that person's anemia. I'll say that this particular study, trivial little study that it was, was actually motivated as are many studies so motivated by, hmm, I'll, I'll stop sure of saying conflict, but I'll just say um, heated conversations that were sometimes happening around this because uh, one of the authors of it was a pharmacist, nice guy, but he was always being approached by industry, the pharma company, to have <clears throat> some kind of phase two study going on with <clears throat> really soft endpoints, really vague, fuzzy, hand-waving kind of endpoints. And the purpose of those studies were really, I mean, I think they were fairly thinly veiled efforts by the pharmaceutical company just to get people, start using it, get in the habit, stop asking questions, stop it with all your randomized study nonsense, just use the stuff. And, and at some level, I found that a little bit annoying. And so that was the actual annoyance that triggered this one little teeny tiny look at that particular equation. But anyway, so you had then suddenly all this evidence in an entire reversal of a decade or more of use of a lot of drugs. And we're not talking about inexpensive things. This was a huge expense. This was gigantic. This was $60 billion worth of expenditure in cancer and in um, stage renal disease for no benefit and actual detriment to patients, which is going along more or less unchallenged. And it was just not uh, so much mm, even talked about, I think at the time until maybe people sort of, it, it, it hit them maybe like, uh, uh, you know, abruptly that, yeah, wow, this was not a good thing to have been doing all these years. And, and that's unfortunate that we did it. It was, you know, talked about the New York Times, Washington Post hit on it, study, uh, a publication right here, 2012, this anemia drug made billions, but at what cost? You know, they quote um, Charles Bennett, <coughs> um, I overlapped with him briefly. Um, he was briefly here. He's, he's a nice guy. He's at the VA hospital here, sort of a, into a health services research. He's in South Carolina, uh, I think now. But in any case, um, he was pointing out, yeah, the, a medical oncologist, the, the typical medical oncologist was making big bucks from doing this, okay? When overnight the FDA starts saying, yeah, you really can't do this anymore. You got to stop. It's, we're not going to keep paying. Medicare is going to just shut the spigot off. I know of individuals, real life stories of oncologists who had to shut down their practice overnight. I mean, because this was such an enormous amount of revenue. I mean, the, the amount of expenditure for Medicare going to just these agents in, the, in that year around 20, 2009, 2010 was several multiples of what the entire expenditure for radiation oncology was in those years. I can tell you it was on the order of six to $8 billion. And all of Radonc was getting about 1.5, 1.8 billion in those years. So um, we're talking about a tremendous amount of money that was suddenly the legs were, were cut out from this enormous revenue stream going into oncology. And so it was yeah, big scientifically, maybe a surprise to us, but it was, it was a gigantic impact that reverberated, I think, throughout the rest of oncology, perhaps a lot more than we did. Here's just more of the same stuff. Um, this is just a, a, some more stuff from the um, Washington Post reports on it, looking at the timeline, putting in some specific intervals. But the thing I, I would point out to you about this particular timeline is, is this. <clears throat> um, so what's going on in the early 2000s is that you have more and more usage of this stuff. And at the same time, you have more and more of these negative studies. So physicians are getting a little bit less and less comfortable about using it. Some of the studies are showing less and less benefit and some detriment. Um, and yet at the same time, the lobbying effort by Andrew actually the pace actually picked up at that point because I think they thought that, um, well, they saw that it was going to be 
a big deal for them. And, you know, I'm not criticizing any one particular pharmaceutical company. Look, this is America. This is how it works. But this is how it was playing out. And this is, this is a thing that was going on. And it's a bigger story than I think I appreciated maybe at the time because looking back on it, I, I think that was, that was a really big deal. That was something that um, overturned oncology as we know it almost overnight, um, uh, not that long ago. So I think it's worth bearing in mind. So anyway, I want to leave maybe a, one second for a softball question. So I'll just have to summarize and say, what are the actual takeaway thoughts and observations? Well, I mean, I think, okay, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. We see it in radiation. We see it in other modalities of treatment. Um, we can't have our feelings hurt by that. It's okay. We want to push the envelope or max out, but it is possible that we will max out for whatever reason. And we can talk about other reasons that might happen. Um, I think that um, it's also important. Preclinical science does matter, but of course, ultimately a clinical test has to happen. I mean, we can debate whether or not there was uh, the strongest amount of preclinical evidence for whatever was tested, but uh, in point of fact, you have to do it in the clinic anyway. Uh, and I would also say the sub point of that is that a proper control arm is also essential. And I just want to say that you know, financial incentives are seductive and it's so easy to fall into patient care patterns that might not be ideal for the patient, but sometimes they're subtle and sometimes it's not so obvious. And the, and the EPO wave was, was not so obvious, I don't think at the time. And I, I think it was going on, um, human nature comes into play. It's really hard, but sometimes you have to just have your Mm, you know, your radar up and, and be alert to things and, and question even some of the common things we do and whether or not sometimes they might not, in fact, always be the best things to do. So, all right, I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention and the chance to talk here. And I'm sorry it's not in person because it was always so nice to be in person. But if there are any easy questions, I'm willing to accept an easy question, uh, not a hard question, but um, I'll stop right there. And thank you again for the chance to chat. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, for that fascinating talk. Um, I, I, I'm going to invite anyone who's with questions to please use the question answer feature located um, at the bottom of the screen there. And I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat box and uh, uh, um, announce the questions as they come in. Um, while we're waiting, I'm just going to mention that uh, next week there is no Grand Rounds and we'll return on Wednesday, September 29th. Uh, when we'll hear from Dr. Stephen uh, Devine from the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. To view all the upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer website or the Winship calendar. Um, so let's see if we've got uh, questions coming in. Just um, come into the chat feature. Here's a couple questions. Um, okay, do uh, Dr. James Janapal Naylor asks, do you think dose escalation in any site is beneficial? <laughs> uh, wow, uh, this, uh, I, could, uh, I could channel uh, Dan Spratt if I wanted to answer that question. First of all, he's, he's a bit of a skeptic for dose escalation being a place we can go and, and sort of is of the opinion that we might have plateaued in a lot of places with that. I would say that, um, you know, we've gotten to a pretty aggressive dose level in a lot of patients. I mean, if you want to take it from top to bottom, I mean, let's just talk about GBM, right? I mean, my God, that's the worst cancer of all, right? Or it's, Top, top three worst cancers, right? And we tried the heck out of it. And, you know, we kind of hit a wall with that. So I, I don't think in that particular instance, simply adding radiation is the ticket. I think there's some other biologically different things we have to do. On the other hand, and not to say that there isn't um, the possibility that in a couple of different places, if we had a way to get radiation a little bit more safe and overall cleanly into certain tumors, we might still have a window of opportunity to improve upon that. So I wouldn't say across the board, I certainly wouldn't use GBM as an example of anything across the board, right? But I wouldn't say across the board. It's necessarily the case. We, we get glimmers of signals here and there still with prostate cancer. Let's go back, let's go to a more common thing, right? We get the, um, uh, there was a study, I can't, I'm blanking on the acronym, acronym of the study that was the simultaneous integrated boost. A little bit of a signal that there might be a little bit of PSA gain at least here and there. So there might be a, small available window there. I, I wouldn't overstate the case there though. Um, so um, I don't know, I think the burden of proof is on the shoulders of someone who wants to really say that in whatever case we really need to escalate. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest, people are sure trying hard. I mean, pancreas cancer, one of the other terrible ones we deal with. Uh, people are still sort of hoping that, you know, just a little more radiation, we can kick its butt. Uh, 
I'm not sure the Alliance study really supports that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope I hope somebody does that. I hope it's achieved, but I'm a little skeptical. So I'll just say maybe say that. I'll stop there. <laughs> thanks. Um, Dr. Ramalingam uh, says, thanks for a very nice presentation. Do you think targeting tumor hypoxia to enhance radiotherapy sensitivity is still a valid line of research? <laughs> That's a great question because it never goes away completely because there's always a European study using carbogen or something like that that comes out and says, oh, look at that, you know, that, that was true. And is that just the one out of 20 studies that is going to have a p-value plus than five? <laughs> it's really hard to say. Um, and and, and it, you're familiar with this territory. I mean, people have approached this from every possible angle, from the angle of trying to say, okay, fine, let's try to reduce the consumption of oxygen in all surrounding tissues because there's more left behind. Maybe that's the way to do it. Um, let's try to improve delivery of oxygen using either <clears throat> blood flow improving agents or some other uh, mechanism of, of changing the rheology of red cells and, and all those sorts of things. Um, I, I don't know, you know, it's a nut somebody might eventually crack and uh, maybe there'll be some TKI. Yeah, you know, having said that, it, it's funny because what little benefit we, or what evidence we have of some benefit to certain agents that are doing something in hypoxic tumors just happen to be some of the most unpopular drugs we have. So like mitomycin C is sort of like a hypoxic cell cytotoxin, right? And it does something and it sensitizes the radiation, but people hate it for whatever reason. I mean, it, it keeps going up head to head against this platinum, winning. And still people just don't, just don't like it. I don't know, it's just not sexy enough or something. Um, there was a small <clears throat> bit of information about terapazamine that was like borderline positive. There's again, one of those um, nimorazole. There was you know, an agent that was popular uh, in Denmark. Uh, I think it's faded away. So I, I don't know, I, it's, it just always keeps coming back. So I keeps getting re-enthusiastic about it. So I, I wouldn't say that no one's ever gonna crack the code. Uh, it's just tantalizing. It's a it's a Cheshire effect, right? It's one of those things just disappears as soon as you as soon as you think you can sink your teeth into it. It seems to just sneak away from just the one that got away. But um, I hope somebody does. I, I don't know. I won't say no, but I'm interested to see who does it first and how they do it. Um. Okay, now, I don't know if this is a hard question or not, but Dr. Stokes says, "Great talk, Brian. Can you speculate on future instances of medical reversal in oncology?" <laughs> Dr. Stokes. Hi there, Dr. Stokes. Uh, um, you know, um, I think that, uh, well, okay, we're going to find some situations where, I don't know if it's fair to say reversal, but uh, I don't know if, do, do we count disappointment about immunotherapy and radiation as a reversal? I'm not so sure. I hate to put it that way because I hate to be like, I'm just a gloom and doom person and saying that, yeah, that was a good idea, but I'm not sure it's working. Because obviously everybody knows that a lot of people have been pretty jazzed about trying to make that connection and find the linkage between doing something with radiation that magnifies or sets on fire the immune system and gets you to really uh, get rid of a lot more tumors by some combination. I think there's probably gonna be still some good uh, good findings there. And I'm not sure, Bill, if you want to call that a reversal or not, but I think we have seen a couple of studies that were, I'm going to say disappointing in terms of the, uh, yeah, I'm going to say the word episcopal effect, very elusive unicorn type effect that a lot of people are really hoping for. Um, you know, Sean McBride study had neck cancer. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And, um, you know, the more recent one, um, I'm blanking on it also you know, less than spectacular results. I'm not saying no one will ever hit the jackpot on that, but um, I don't know. I'm not sure that counts as a reversal, but it's a disappointment at this point. However, there's so much to be excited about, having said that. So, you know, you can't have everything, right? So a lot of progress has been made, just the fact that you can add it selectively together and do really good things for patients and there still will be more patient populations identified that benefit from that. I mean, hey, there's, there's a lot to be uh, positive about. So uh, I don't, I don't want to be all negative. Um, another question from Dr. David Lawson, uh, things make it into practice without randomized trials pretty often, especially new technology and new techniques. How can we increase the use of trials in the evaluation of technology? It's a great question. And it's so hard because 
the, the way that drugs get approved and into the market is so fundamentally different than how devices do that it's it's such a different pathway that it's it's unfortunate really um it would be i think better if there was a little bit of a steeper hurdle to get over for some technological um, advances and it would be something that would give us really stronger and more robust data for a lot of you know, everything doing radiation is technological right and um it's rare to have a head-to-head -head comparison I mean, uh sapria uh chopper study uh imrt post-op versus uh, conventional uh, it just came out i believe it was presented at astro and preliminary form a few years ago um i haven't read the full study yet but um rare example of technology and radiation being compared head to head. Again, there's devilish details in there, I'm sure I haven't read the whole study, but that's a nice example. Um, it would have been even greater if that sort of thing had happened earlier on, because then maybe we would have had a better understanding and ability to start implementing certain things earlier with appropriate justification for reimbursement for expenses for doing it. Um, be that as may, um, those are really hard studies to do comparing variations of how to do radiation or uh, try, try doing a proton-photon randomized study, right? I mean, it's just really uh, just about impossible, right? Because I'm gonna have to tell you guys, it's really hard. Um, I applaud everyone who's trying and I hope it advances the science and it's, it's starting to be a few glimmers coming out here and there. So that's really good. But um, I don't know an easy answer with, with the way the current system is set up because um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a low, clearing 510k clearance just getting a getting a, a device out there just because you proved it's similar enough to another device that's on the market is is a, a, a trivial exercise for most medical devices at least in the radiology space um so um yeah tough one tough to get with the strong proof that we would love to have Um, Dr. Tony Yang asks, asks, at what point do you transfuse patients before radiation at this point? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, well, when they're symptomatic, you know, I mean, like people are feeling really weak for a breath, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I used to treat cervix cancer patients I, I, earlier in my career, so I don't cover the GYN cancer space anymore. Uh, I think every place has its uh, just style and routines and such as that. Around here, I can tell you that if the hemoglobin is below 10 or so and there's the slightest bit of symptoms, yeah, we probably try to get them above 10, roughly. But we don't necessarily go out of our way if the person's asymptomatic, nine-ish or so. Yeah, um, uh, it's, so it's a little bit more symptom-driven. Um, but I, I don't know if... If you guys have a hard and fast rule or a strong cutoff or, or type policy around Emory, I'd be curious to know. Um, yeah, the residents may be able to give you answers. Okay, we'll yeah. save that one for the resident yeah. discussion, sure. Um, another question came up uh, about hypoxia. In hypo um, based on path findings uh, of each individual case, if no hypoxic components uh, in the tumor uh, can EPO or cousin drugs be given without compromising the survival? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't touch on the speculated mechanisms of why EPO might or might not be good because I'm not that smart and I probably wouldn't do justice to it. But from what I know of the actual mechanism of how EPO works physiologically, what it does when it's working inside the bone marrow to stimulate red cell production, it is an anti-apoptotic agent. So it does hit receptors and have um, uh, the, the effect of preventing apoptosis in some of the red cell precursors. And oh God, if there's a hematologist in the audience, they'd probably just laugh or just like just turn away and disgust at the terrible job I am give, I'm doing now of explaining my understanding of how EPI actually works. Um, and my understanding is also that there are and there is enough similarity with cell surface receptors on some cancer cells that sometimes EPO can have an anti-apoptotic effect. That's one of the mechanisms I believe that has been advanced to explain some of the negative outcomes with the EPO studies. Uh, please correct me, residents or whoever, uh, if I'm so badly wrong on that particular explanation. 
afterwards. So um, I would say, I, I think I'm not so sure if you are on safe grounds giving it just for the sake of giving it, um, because I think the negatives might be a more nuanced sort of negative than, than you might expect, or than that might be predicted. Okay, let's see, um, a couple more. Um, anonymous attendee says, thank you for a great and thought-provoking presentation. You mentioned that you don't think that accelerated repopulation occurs. Could you expand, expand briefly? Sure. <clears throat> I, I didn't, I thought about, you know, I, I, I thought somebody might ask that question. I thought about putting in some auxiliary slides. I didn't, I'm sorry about that. So I'll have to describe with words some pictures, right? So if you remember the graph that started the conversation, that 1988 paper by Withers, okay? What it was, was a graph of time of treatment on the x-axis and estimated dose for 50% tumor controls, TCD50 on the y-axis. And there was an apparent relationship where the more time it took, the more dose we were calculated to get for TCD50. But there are several actual flaws just in that particular analysis. And, or I should say, there's several critiques of drawing the conclusion that was drawn from that paper that were much better articulated than I'm gonna articulate them by Soren Benson, I don't know, 20 some years ago, 30 years ago, uh, when he and a guy named Howard Thames were the last two people to be a little bit critical of this idea. And the essential critique goes something like this, that the, the biggest of the three goes something like this. Um, first of all, it's a derived metric, this TCD50 metric that you have derived through a couple of hand-waving <clears throat> um, uh, formulas. But even if we put aside that it's a little bit derived, Secondly, you haven't necessarily proved that you need the higher dose when treatment is prolonged as much as you might have just proved that when treatment goes over seven weeks instead of five weeks, you have given more dose. So in other words, what if it's the case that we just hit a 50% control rate no matter what we give? We might then conclude that, ah, oh, well, when we give it in five weeks, it's 50 gray. When we give it in six weeks, it takes 60 gray to get that 50% control rate, 70 gray and seven weeks, et cetera. But it's an artifactual relationship. It's not a real thing. So that was one of the, I'd say mathematical critiques of that particular whole line of thing. The clinical critiques of it are that I think, um, well, okay. Um, there might, there, there, there the, the, uh, the Hanka studies, I think one or two of the Hanka studies did in fact suggest that accelerating the treatment by giving six treatments instead of five showed a tiny benefit here and there. And maybe that's the case. <clears throat> um, and, and maybe it is, maybe there is a small window for being able to reverse uh, something or, or being able to get a little tiny bit of juice out of the accelerating the treatment. However, I think once you enter into the chemo RT era, um, I'm gonna blank on the numbers of all the studies, but I mean, the the Chemo RT in standard fractionation every time it's tested against chemo RT with a faster radiation fractionation, it tends to, and that doesn't usually pan out as, as a potential advantage. And so while there might be this small window somewhere for some situations where advancing or accelerating the treatment might get you some benefit, I think, I, I, not because of accelerated repopulation, but just because it might be a more intense way to do it, I think it washes out with chemo. But then again, the only other thing I would say, okay, there were some other, okay, my ill-fated, short, brief, failed career as a physician scientist um, working in Virginia. There was a paper that was cited in the one I showed you where um, we had looked specifically to see if we could actually conjure up accelerated, accelerated repopulation in the laboratory setting, okay? And so we did the world's dumbest um, radiobiology experiment, I would say, or one of the dumbest ones, which is to say, okay, fine, let's find a dose that is going to keep the number of cells in the dish stable day to day. And let's say we do that for a week 
And then we see how fast it grows from there. And let's say we do it for two weeks and see how fast it grows from there. Through. On the bottom line, the upshot of doing that tedious and uninteresting exercise, if you were to do it, is that what you do is you select, <clears throat> after a certain point, after about a week or two, you select the fastest cycling subpopulation. So it's not, I don't think you've accelerated it as much as you now see the one end of the bell-shaped curve of the cells that are going a little bit, we're always chugging along a little bit faster than the ones that got hit easily and got out of the way faster. And, and that sort of thing plateaued. So in other words, you, you, could, you could select out the faster of the subpopulation, but, but even there, there's a, there's a maximum speed or a minimum cell cycling time. I think that cells would hit at least in a dish and probably in, in vivo that, um, so that I don't think it's a true acceleration as much as a selection of things. That's my take on it. You can certainly debate that, um, but that would be how I would interpret it. Okay, one, one last question, uh, an important topic, and uh, maybe your health policy angle helps, helps here. Uh, Connie Allen asks, uh, what are the financial sources for research on the social determinants of health and lifestyle medicine in cancer? What are the financial resources to do that? Wow. Um, that's a great question because those are, that, that's such an important um, area. And I think if what you're getting at is, well, it's not my original coinage of the term, but uh, if you follow this guy, he's in Canada now, Bishal Gyawali, uh, he coined the term ground shot. Um, more than a moonshot, a lot of places need a ground shot, or at least at the same time, we should do a ground shot against cancer, which is to say, uh, we should be sure that we are distributing the things that we know do a pretty good job, a little bit better. And so in developing countries, <clears throat> for example, you can make the case that there just aren't enough Linux or enough people to run the Linux. And so, um, you know, that's an extreme example that's, that's outside the United States, but in the United States, of course, you are going to um, see a lot of situations where you will have under-resourced um, situations with, um, you know, you name it, uh, inner city populations, uh, rural populations who are, you know, not as socioeconomically advantaged as metropolitan or suburban locations. They have a lot of advantages. They can get people back and forth to treatments as simple things like that. Um, so um, I don't know, but I do know that a lot of people are trying to be creative about finding solutions that are even low tech-ish kind of solutions to that. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit more telemedicine will be a little bit helpful. And so that's not really a, you know, an obvious source of research necessarily funding, but uh, maybe if we can, make the strong enough case to sustain it, perhaps that at least helps a little bit here and there with at least ongoing care for some patients because just taking away expenses like parking and transportation to some people is meaningful and makes a you know, tangible difference. So there are those people who are, who are you know, conceding that to do massive sea changes in the way that our healthcare system in the United States is structured is, you know, that's, that's changing an ocean liner, steering an ocean liner, that's really, really hard. Uh, but chipping away at some of the smaller things, you know, if you follow Fumiko Chino's work, she's all into that. And, she, you know, again, sometimes working on just making a point about how sometimes little things make a big difference, you know, parking fees and, uh, um, you know, transportation help is, is sometimes that little thing that gets a, a few more people over the edge to at least being able to be compliant with regular treatment, let alone, you know, expensive, fancy stuff. So um, that's not really a, a direct answer to your question because I don't know, I don't have in my head a list of actual resources of that. I hope, hope there are some, um, but it's an important area of research and I, I hope people make good progress in it. Okay. Uh, well, that was all the questions. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, thank, thanks again for an excellent presentation this morning. Um, I know our residents are very excited for the opportunity to get to meet with you um, next, and then to also to present our uh, annual resident research day to you uh, later this afternoon. Looking forward to all that. Can't thank wait. You. Thanks again for a chance to chat with everybody. See you soon.